my previous video, Why Jesus Told Stories, I argued that Jesus' parables are uniquely one-sided. When Jesus tells a parable, he gives one side of the analogy, expecting those who hear the parable to tacitly grasp the meaning. The mysteries of the kingdom were granted to the apostles, and therefore only those who study the writings of the apostles are prepared to grasp the meaning. So that we might know how to read and understand Jesus' parables, he gives us an exemplar parable, wherein he not only tells us the story, he also supplies the meaning. Having both the parable and his explanation in hand, we now have a roadmap to guide us in our exploration of the other parables. Today I want to talk about the parable of the sower, which Luke records in the 8th chapter of his Gospel. I hope my own observations will be helpful to your own studies. Let's get started. In the Gospel of John, Jesus talks a lot about why some individuals don't believe the Word of God when they first hear it, or if they do believe it when they hear it, why an individual might stop believing it later. He recognizes that many barriers to belief exist, which is why he often refers to those who are ready to receive the truth as those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. When it comes to the hard truths, our hearts need to be prepared in advance to believe the message once we finally hear it. The parable of the sower employs a typical farming activity to illustrate why the human heart needs to be prepared in advance to receive, believe, and persevere in the truth. Whether a seed germinates into a plant depends on whether the seed was planted on the road or into the soil. Whether the seed continues to grow into a healthy plant, producing fruit, depends on the quality of the soil present where the seed landed. And this story, in some way, illustrates aspects of the human heart that allow or forbid belief and provide for the continuation of belief even in the face of difficulty. When a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road and it was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The best way to understand a parable is to understand the story on its own terms first. That is, we do well to delay our search for the implied meaning until we fully understand the straightforward meaning. Jesus' stories come from everyday life, and we find these situations very familiar, easy to understand, and quite accessible. The parable of the sower is a story about a farmer who is planting his field with wheat or barley or something else. He describes a very common way to sow seed known as broadcast seeding, a method of seeding that involves scattering seed by hand or mechanically over a relatively large area. The sower reaches into his bag, takes out a fistful of seed, and with a sweeping motion of the arm, he lets the seed fly outwardly away from his body. Imagine the first time the farmer prepared his field for planting. He walks the entire field looking for rocks, twigs, and other debris. Imagine his field is also fronted by a road that runs along the boundary. He places the rocks and other debris next to the road out of the way. Next he plows the field by hand or with the help of an animal and in the process he finds more rocks and other debris, which he also places next to the road. In order to make sure to cover the entire field with seed, some of it is allowed to fly beyond the boundaries of the field a bit. In order to achieve the best yield from his land, the farmer sows his fields all the way to the edges, not only broadcasting the seed into the good soil, but allowing a little bit of it to fall on the thorny soil, 
the rocky edges of the field, and even some on the road. Seeds sown in this manner are distributed over the soils that result in various degrees of plant growth and maturity. For instance, the road is impenetrable and compacted by foot and cart traffic. The seed can't enter the soil and germinate, so birds will eat them. This method of planting does not ensure that all seeds are sown at the correct depth. Rocky soil, for instance, is too shallow, offering only a little bit of soil for germination. But once the heat of summer arrives, the roots of the plant don't run deep enough to find water. The plants wither and die. Thorny soil is deep enough to germinate seeds, and the plants are able to grow to maturity. The presence of thorns is indicative of pretty good soil, and the wheat might do well except the wheat plants compete with the thorn plants for water and nourishment. They both grow up together, but the wheat plants produce no fruit. Finally, the good soil is suitable for plant growth and maturity because the farmer has well prepared the soil, removing all the rocks and thorn plants. Not only this, the farmer has plowed the field, turning over the uppermost layer of soil which brings the fresh nutrients to the surface, while burying weeds and crop remains to decay. In conclusion, we know that the farmer wants to produce a crop of wheat or something else, and we know that the soil preparation makes a big difference with regard to seed growth and maturity. Only the seed that falls in the good soil will reach maturity and give the farmer the fruit he seeks. Now that we understand the story on its own terms, we are ready to hear Jesus give his interpretation of the story. The story has meaning on its own terms, but it also stands as an analogy to a more significant and profound fact about the Kingdom of God. Typically, Jesus leaves his followers to explore and discover the meaning of the stories, having studied the writings of the Apostles, learning the mysteries of the Kingdom from these men through the process of Bible study, prayer, and meditation. But in this rare instance, Jesus teaches us how to interpret his stories by giving us this exemplar. Jesus explains this parable, starting in verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and hold it fast, and bear fruit with perseverance. Immediately we learn that the soil represents a person's heart, what Paul the Apostle sometimes calls the inner man, and at other times calls the conscience. This is the location of our feelings and our thoughts where we reason things out, weigh arguments, and make decisions. The story depicts a farmer casting seed on the ground. As we said earlier, this is called broadcast seeding, which is a method of seeding that involves scattering seed. In this way, Jesus is representing the efforts of a preacher or an evangelist who speaks to large crowds of people, not knowing which particular person will believe the word or continue to believe it once having heard it. The message is cast forth widely like a sower casting seed, to everyone within earshot of the preacher. He has no guarantee how his message will be received. He expects that some of them will reject it, but some of them will receive it. Jesus expands our thinking to realize that even among those who believe God's word, only a fraction of those will persevere, continue in the faith, and not fall away. Jesus postulates four different dispositions of the inner man. The road represents the heart hardened against the word of God. The rocky soil represents a person lacking courage to believe the truth even in the face of opposition. The soil containing thorns represents a double-minded individual vacillating between competing motives and desires. The good soil represents an individual with a single-minded devotion and commitment to the truth, willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads, 
with the courage to stand firm in the truth even under pressure from the opposition or even the tedium of everyday life. Jesus says that Satan is like a bird that takes the seed away. How does Satan do that? Well, once a person has decided not to grant a hearing to the preacher, Satan offers the person any number of rationalizations and excuses to bolster that choice. Satan helps some people justify and explain away the Word of God in a seemingly rational or logical manner in order to avoid the true explanation. Such rationalizations are made consciously tolerable or even admirable to those who have hardened their heart against the truth. The rocky soil represents an inner disposition lacking in moral courage and conviction. Such a person lacks discipline, self-control, and commitment. Shallow people likely take the easy way, but the easy way isn't always the best way. Many of the best things in life are accomplished by those who are willing and able to take the hard way. Moral courage is the courage to take action for moral reasons, despite the risk of adverse consequences. Courage is required to take action when one has doubts or fears about the consequences. Moral courage, therefore, involves deliberation or careful thought. The rocky soil, then, represents those who give up easily when times get tough, when family and friends question their choice, or when temptation draws them away. When the pressure is applied, doubts begin to arise and such people become indecisive. James the Apostle writes about this in his epistle. But the one seeking wisdom from God must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. We saw earlier that Satan is able to offer an unbeliever any number of rationalizations in order to avoid the truth. Here we see that he is also able to offer these same rationalizations to those who are double-minded and forget to draw near to God. James exhorts these individuals to purify their hearts through penitence and contrition, which is the beginning of repentance. If one should draw near to God, then God will draw near to him or her. The soil among the thorns looks at the issue from the other perspective. Whereas some individuals leave the faith under pressure, other individuals leave the faith after losing interest and become apathetic. This individual is not concentrating his aim on a single purpose. Instead, he attempts to juggle many aims and many purposes. Many competing desires, values, and needs prevent this individual from giving full attention to his faith. Jesus says this individual is choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and he brings no fruit to maturity. Although this individual has not formally renunciated his faith, in essence, his double-mindedness has resulted in a de facto apostasy. Having reviewed the negative attributes of the other soils, we are now in a position to appreciate the good soil. Jesus says the good soil is analogous to the individual who hears the word with an honest and good heart and bears fruit with perseverance. People having the qualities required for perseverance in the faith are open to the possibility of truth, weighing evidence and assessing sources, and if found to be true, such people will believe the word of God when hearing it. These individuals are savvy and not willing to accept the rationalization Satan offers. These individuals are strong in character, having moral courage, conviction, and deep commitment to single aim, seeking first the kingdom of God. One final observation. In the story, the farmer or someone else prepares the soil for the seed. The soil doesn't prepare itself. The soil doesn't decide to become a road. It doesn't decide to have rocks or thorns. Someone makes the soil ready to receive the seeds. 
and only one soil condition is suitable for the kind of plant growth that results in fruit. Who prepares the human heart, then? The Holy Spirit. For instance, the Apostle Paul often associates the work of the Spirit with the condition of the heart. Romans 2.29 But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men but from God. Romans 5.5 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. 2 Corinthians 1.22 Who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3, Being manifested that you are a letter of Christ cared for by us, written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. Galatians 4.6 Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Ephesians 1, 13-14 In Him you also, having listened to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. Titus 3, 5 He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. Inwardly, the Holy Spirit is transforming the hearts and minds of those whom God is saving. Paul says that a Jew is one inwardly. The Spirit in the heart is a pledge of inheritance for them and us. Inwardly, those whom God is saving are generated and renewed by the Holy Spirit so that we might be cleansed by the Word of God. Outwardly, those whom God is saving exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When it comes to the hearts of individuals, the Holy Spirit is the one who plows the field. If the seed produces the fruits of the Spirit, it's because the Spirit has prepared the heart ahead of time. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful to your own studies. If you did, please click thumbs up and subscribe. Thanks for watching.